Hi, I'm Miranda Wright, and this is day 48 of our 120-day Upper Room Prayer Campaign. And today we're going to pray against a spirit of selfishness and pride. You see, the Bible says that the fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. So we understand that we must pray fervently and we must also be righteous for our prayers to have power. But my friend, I'm here to tell you today the easiest way to know if the actions that you take and the decisions that you make are in right standing with God. And I can simplify it down to this. Every act of unrighteousness comes from a place of selfishness and pride. And every act of righteousness comes from a place of selflessness and humility. So in every circumstance and situation, if you want to test the spirit, if you want to test what it is that you're hearing, if you want to know if it's really coming from the Lord or from another voice, ask yourself, is this rooted in selfishness or pride? Or is this rooted in selflessness and humility? Because you see, my friend, sin is selfish because sin is pride and pride is selfish. There are two sides of the same coin. You, you cannot truly have one without the other. Sin always hurts somebody else. The greatest example that we see in scripture of selfishness and pride is presented in Lucifer himself. That archangel who was created to worship God, who walked before the throne of God, who was created the most beautiful of all God's creatures with every manner of music manifesting out of his very being as he worshipped before the throne. But yet he set his eyes on God and decided that he wanted the worship. He said, I will make my throne above the stars of heaven, my friend. It was absolutely prideful for him to think that he could do that and it was selfish of him to even want to. Therefore did Satan fall because of his selfishness and his pride and he took a third of the angels with him. My friend, sin is selfish. It will always hurt somebody else in the process. Adam and Eve, they walked with God in the cool of the garden. They had everything they could ask for. They had food provided for them. They had communion with the Father. They lived in paradise. What more could they want? And yet the devil comes in and slips in that sin and plays on their selfishness and convinces them that they need more. He tells them, I can give you all knowledge. I can make you as God. My friend, I tell you that it was prideful for them to think it even possible, but it started with the root of selfishness that they would even want it to be done. There is a spirit of selfishness and pride that permeates the culture today. People never satisfied with where they are and with what God has given them. The Bible says to be content in all things. We've got to have faith that God has a purpose for our positioning. And if we don't quit grabbing for somebody else's vineyard, we're never going to see the fruitfulness that could have come from ours. Instead, we're going to continue to destroy all the vineyards around us as we try to attain something that was never meant to be. My friend, the churches of the nation are, are working in a spirit of Ahab falling to the influence of Jezebel, mainly because a root of selfishness. They are not content with where God has placed them. Like Esau, who God says despised his birthright and was willing to sell it for a bowl of soup. He was grabbing for the things of the flesh. And because he did not account the inheritance that God had for him, in God's eyes, he said it was the same as if Esau had despised it. My friend, if you are not content with what the Lord has placed you in, the season, the gifting, the calling, the positioning, then you are despising your birthright. Because we have to be faithful in the little before he will make us rulers over much. And that little lot that he's got you in could be the next Bethlehem. That births a deliverer. Because you see, my friend, it was said in the time of Jesus, what good can come out of Bethlehem? But it was Bethlehem that God chose to birth the redemption of man. We've got to stop looking for the grand things and start walking in humility, 
so God can bring the greater things. In 1 Timothy 6 verse 3 it says, If a man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud and he doesn't know anything. He doteth about questions and, sh- and strifes of words, wherefore cometh envying. In other words, he's, he goes around preaching questionable doctrine, stirring up your flesh, bringing strifes of words that do nothing but bring up envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. These men that Paul is warning Timothy about, he's saying they preach all of these things that do nothing but stir up these evil spirits and give the enemy access through encouraging envy, strife, and they do it By preaching that material gain is godliness. You know what the Bible says? Look at the next phrase. From such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Did you know that the Bible says that anybody who preaches to you that material or earthly gain is godliness? The Bible says to run away from them. Withdraw yourself. Have nothing to do with them. They are preaching doctrines of demons. It is not in alignment with the word of God. What the word of God says is that to walk in godliness with contentment, to be content with bearing the fruits of godliness, selflessness, love, and humility. This is great gain. He continues to say, for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out and having food and clothes, let us be there with content. My friend, as long as I have the love of God, the word of God and the Holy Spirit of the living God in my heart and a breath in my lungs, that's all I need. I will be content because I can continue to preach the word, to do the will of the Father, with everything that is in me, whatever it costs, because I'm not living for the here and now. I'm keeping my eyes on the prize, on the cross of Jesus Christ, and I'm marching on for the resurrection. I'm living for eternity. I'm not living for what you can give me. I'm not living for what I can build in the here and now. I'm storing up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy. I will make decisions based on selflessness and humility. And in doing so, I know I will be in right standing with my king. But the Bible says that those who will follow the Antichrist spirit, they will be self-willed. He talked about those who have that spirit of Balaam, who sell men's souls for profit because they're concerned with material gain, with building their kingdom, with getting a bigger house, with getting more property, with getting a bigger ministry or a bigger business, with getting more notoriety. With vainglory, all they are concerned about are the physical, material things of this world. The Bible says they are spots in your feast of charity. So again, my friend, I tell you that the word of the living God says that anyone who preaches that gain, material gain, equates to godliness, that it is a reflection of your favor from the Lord because the more favor you have, the more he is blessing you with material things. My friend, I'm telling you, it is doctrines of demons. The Bible says, withdraw yourself. Because Jesus said, blessed are the poor in heart. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Because these things are storing up treasures for you in heaven. Because those that are concerned with material gain are functioning from a root of selfishness and of pride. And the Bible says that these things are a snare. They are a trap of the enemy. In fact, it says that they are thorns that grow up and choke out a once fruitful tree, a tree a seed that has been planted, a tree that has been grown. It is bearing fruit. It is spreading those seeds to others. It has a purpose and a place. And these thorns grow up and they began to choke it out. And the Bible says the thorns are the deceitfulness of riches and the cares of this world. Anything that turns your focus back to self, back to the here and now and away from eternity and getting souls to make it there is not of God. 
My friend, I tell you again, if you want to discern the spirit in operation, ask yourself, is it speaking to my selfishness and my pride? Or is it causing me to do what is selfless and humble that I might labor to bring others to the truth of Jesus Christ? My friend, we've got to be cautious of this because selfishness will cause us to want to believe and listen to the lies of the enemy, to those things that he is offering us, to those words that he's giving, to the things that he is speaking into our ear. And then once we've accepted it, pride will cause us to want to keep it. Selfishness will cause you to fall into sin and pride will keep you there. Do you know that if you look at the Ten Commandments and you go through every one of them, you can break it down to the simplicity of these two functions. For example, thou shall not commit adultery. Adultery is selfish. Therefore, if you move in selfishness, you will commit adultery. You will break the commandment. If you move in selflessness, you will not. Thou shalt not covet. Coveting is selfish. If you are selfish, you will covet. If you are selfless, you will not. You can go down the list and it will apply to everyone. And if you go to the book of Galatians and read the fruits of the flesh versus the fruits of the spirit, you will see the same thing. That every manifestation of the fruits of the flesh, envy, strife, murder, the list goes on and on. They are all functions of selfishness and of pride. But when you read the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control, you will see that they are all a function of selflessness and of humility. Because you see, my friends, humility and selflessness is the very character of God himself. If the devil was the greatest example that we have of selfishness and pride, then the greatest example that we have of selflessness and humility is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was God in the flesh, and yet he came to be born in a barn like an animal, like a baby lamb, to be raised up, to be led as a lamb to the slaughter. The Bible says, humbling himself even unto the cross for our sake, for the blessed hope that was set before him that we might see his example and walk therein because he's trying to teach us how to recognize what is of him and what is sin. And my friend, I'm going to tell you again, if it's rooted in pride and selfishness, it's of the devil. But if it's rooted in humility and selflessness, it's of God. The world will tell you that you need to have pride, but the Bible says that pride comes before a fall. The world will tell you that you need more self-esteem, but the Bible says to esteem others better than self. The world will tell you do what you have to do to climb that ladder, but Jesus said to always take the lowest seat and allow the Father himself to elevate you in due time. The world says that a person has to give you what you want if they really love you. But the Bible says that there is no greater love than this, that a man should lay down his life for a friend. When the Pharisees asked Jesus, what was the greatest commandment of all? Jesus said to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. And the second is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two hang all of the laws and the prophets. In other words, if you are selfless and humble and you love God first and foremost and above all, and then you love others second and put yourself last, you will automatically fulfill every law that God has given and every word that he has spoken through the prophets. You will be in right standing. My friend, we've got to learn how to humble ourselves and trust God to take care of us, to reward us, to exalt us, and stop walking all over each other while trying to exalt ourselves. The Bible says, let this same mind that was in Christ be in you. That even though he was equal with God, he humbled himself even unto the cross. It's time we pick up our cross, crucify the flesh, humble ourselves, walk selflessly in selfless, sacrificial, agape love, and follow after Christ. Because my friend, the late great Leonard Ravenhill would often say this, and it's more applicable now than any time in history. He said the world doesn't need a new definition of Christianity. It needs a new demonstration of Christianity. It's time that we be the difference that we need to see in the world. And you start by getting on your knees and humbling yourself before the king. Because my friend, let me reveal something to you. Every aspect of salvation is a demonstration of humility. 
We must repent and that takes humility. We must believe that God is who he is and therefore we are who we are in reference to him. And that takes humility. We have to be willing to cry out to him to save us and that takes humility. We have to be willing to confess our sins. That they are sins, that we recognize that they were sins, that we were wrong and that we need him to cleanse us of them and forgive us. And that takes humility. And we've got to come to recognize that the lost people around us need to walk in this salvation. And our loved ones need to see a demonstration of the selfless love of Christ manifested in this generation. And that is going to take selflessness. My friend, salvation is rooted in laying down yourself and humbling before God. Salvation is a demonstration and a manifestation of selflessness and humility and if we can't come to that place of selfless humility then we can't rightly even say that we are saved nor that we are led by the spirit of the living God who is the very demonstration of selfless humility the Bible says that God resists the proud but he gives more grace unto the humble if we are saved by grace through faith then we can only grab hold of it through humility there is no other way We cannot attain it by works. We cannot attain it by having a great knowledge of the Bible. If we are not willing to humble ourselves to what we have read and, and be selfless enough to apply it to our everyday lives, it has done nothing. We can do all the works and build all these mighty kingdoms and big ministries and put on big shows. If it was done out of a heart of pride or vainglory, if we won't humble ourselves to reach the least of these, if we're not selfless enough to sacrifice and get down on our knees and do what is truly pleasing to the Lord, spend that time with Him, be emptied out before Him so that He can fill you up with the power of the kingdom, that people might get more than a show, that they might get the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage off of their life and sets them free to worship the king for all eternity. My friend, we have done nothing. In Micah 6 verse 7 it says, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my own body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what hath the Lord required of thee. What God requires, this is what God says is good. He says it's not all the works. It's not all the flash. It's not all the show. This is what the Lord says is good. This is what pleases him. This is what is required of thee, but to do justly, which takes selflessness and humility, and to love mercy, which takes selflessness and humility, and to walk humbly with thy God. Because you see, my friend, the Bible says in Amos chapter 5, can two walk together except they agree and God himself is the very definition of humility so for me to walk with God and for him to walk with me we must agree that we have to walk in absolute humility so God we pray for a spirit of humility we pray for a spirit of selflessness to come upon us and we take authority in the name of Jesus against that spirit of materialism, against that spirit of envy, against that spirit of covetousness, against that spirit of selfishness, against that spirit of pride that rises up, that is so prevalent in this nation and in this world in the name of Jesus. It has no place in the church. It has no place in the life of a believer. It has no place in those who claim the name of the Lord God Almighty, who is the very demonstration of humility and selflessness. Lord, help us to be led of your spirit that we might walk by the leading thereof and represent you rightly because your word says that we have 
have to walk worthy of the vocation of which we have been called. We've got to represent you. We've got to be a representation of what you really are. You have called us to be your ambassadors in this earth. Oh Lord, I pray that you break down and humble those who bring shame and reproach upon your name and stir up envy and lust and desires for vainglory and the material things of this world in the people because you said that they are speaking lies and hypocrisies and drawing men's eyes away from the things that really matter, the things that bear fruit in our life and prepare us for eternity, that store up treasures where it counts. God, I pray that people would stop looking at the selfish things of this world and what they want and what their flesh desires and what their mind thinks they deserve and that they will walk humbly before their Lord to see what it is that you have called them to do because God I'm afraid that many are missing their callings because they have received a lie that the anointing comes without a price And so when they see that there is a price to be paid, they stray because they don't recognize that what you were setting them up for was for greater things in this life and in the one to come because we got to be willing to lay some stuff down before you're willing to pour some stuff out. God, we need an outpouring. We need a fresh outpouring, but we need a people on which you can pour it. So my friend, today I say that we are going to pray with all of our might against that spirit of pride, that selfishness, that materialism, that lie of the enemy in the name of Jesus. We call it out and we cast it out. It is not scriptural and it has no place in the house of God. Lord, you are a good father and you do bless your children. But the Bible is clear that you bless most those who desire it the least because you always pour out more on the least of these. The servant is the greatest in the kingdom. My friend, I remind you again that God is so faithful that he will sometime lead you in to trials of great reward because he knows that in the end it will produce a greater weight of glory. Because if you've got to be pressed now to get a little bit of that selfishness out, it will be worth it to make sure that you are worthy to receive the reward that he desires for you. Because my friend, the Bible says that in the end, each man, every man, that's the sinners and the saints, will go before the Lord God Almighty and we shall all be judged according to our works. And Jesus told Peter, who had left behind his family, his business, his home, his boats, his employees, everything he forsook for the sake of the call. And Jesus told him, Peter, I assure you of this. There is no man that has not laid down things in this life that he will not get back greater, both in this life, though it will be mixed with persecution and trial, but also in the life to come. My friend, we've got to live selflessly again, and we've got to be willing to walk humbly with our God. Because I am so tired of the selfish, prideful, envious, covetous, greedy, Balaam's, false prophets, bringing shame and reproach upon the name of the Lord God Almighty and turning people away from Christianity because they think that it's fake because all they hear is a gimme gimme message. And they see men with million dollar homes asking for money from widows My friend, that is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus had to borrow a penny to illustrate his own sermon and then he gave it back. So my friend, I warn you again, when you get that word or when you hear that sermon, you need to do what God said to do and test the spirits to see whether or not it be of God. You need to ask yourself, is this feeding my flesh or my soul? Is this rooted in selfishness or selflessness? Is this rooted in pride or in humility? Is this a lie or is this the truth? You need to get on your knees and bring it before your king and let him show you in the word because my friend, if you do not know the word, you will be deceived because the enemy always tries to feed you what your flesh wants to hear. And Paul said with tears, I fear that you will believe it. So God, again, we come against that spirit of materialism, which is rooted in selfishness and pride, the lies of the enemy. 
God, remind us of the humility of Mount Calvary and the suffering that you endured to bring the purity of your word to us, Lord, that we might humble ourselves to receive it, to believe it, to be it, to preach it, to walk in it, to be a demonstration of it because the power of the kingdom of God is not in word. It is in the power of demonstration. I will choose to be selfless and walk humbly before my king. And I pray, Lord, that you raise up a generation who will do the same. No more faking. No more hypocrisy. No more fleecing the sheep. No more vainglory. We want to see the greater things, the kingdom of God, so we will walk in humility.